Welcome back, folks, to my WrestleMania video series where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network. Today, I'll be talking about the 2009 installment of TLC, the Tables, Ladders, and Chairs pay-per-view, as seen on the WWE Network. Of course, as a... Although I was a fan at the time, I did not watch the pay-per-view live. So watching it back on the WWE Network for the very first time was kind of an interesting experience, to say the least. So kicking off the pay-per-view for the ECW Championship was a ladder match between Christian and Shelton Benjamin, two baby faces on the ECW brand at that time. Christian, easily one of, if not the greatest ECW champion in WWE's history of that title. Um, holding that championship, I think, close to eight months or something like that. I think he won it in July of 2009. Held it almost until the brand's closing in, in February of 2010 before dropping it to Ezekiel Jackson. Of course, that infamous story. But, um, you know, in that time, he would have great, uh, many of great title defenses, and this being one of them, one of the most underrated ladder matches, in my, in my opinion, anyway. Christian and Benjamin, two very seasoned vets, but that didn't stop them from having a very enjoyable opening bout on this show. Christian emerged victorious, still the ECW champion. Um, the only real thing of note from this match, aside from the fact that they got a lot of good time, about 18 minutes, so a very good opening matchup, um, was the fact they did have to stop at one point. I think it was Shelton or Christian. I can't remember which one it was. Obviously, it was one of the two. But uh, one of them was busted open at one point. This was around that period of time. Not right after they went PG, about a year and a half later they went, uh, this was a year and a half after they went PG, but this was around the time when they were stopping matches because people were bleeding and all this other bullshit, and uh, that happened in this contest and people booed during that point. It wasn't that big of a deal, it was you know, kind of uh, missable, it was kind of forgettable anyway, but that didn't hinder the overall performance of this contest, so that it was a great way to kick off the show. So like I said before, Christian's still your ECW champion after this matchup. Up next, we had the Intercontinental Championship up for, line, up for grabs with the then Intercontinental Champion John Morrison defending against Drew McIntyre. Now, Drew McIntyre had debuted in the WWE only a few months prior to this over the course of the summer of 2009, quickly squashed our truth at the 09 Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, which I reviewed here on the Channel Chief Plug if you want to go back and check it out. And he would move on to the Intercontinental Championship picture. Um, John Morrison had a pretty good reign as champion with successful title defenses against Dolph Ziggler that fall before moving into the feud with Drew McIntyre. Um, pretty good match here. McIntyre always thought was, you know, everyone always thought he was an underrated talent. Was not one of his best matches here. I thought their notice qualification match in January of 2010, I think it was the following month, I thought that was a better match than this. But um, this was still a pretty good matchup for McIntyre and Morrison, which would, of course, end in McIntyre. Um, I think it was a clean victory, too. Maybe it was an eye poke that uh, put Morrison out. So it was kind of dirty, but aside from that, it was a rather clean victory from Drew McIntyre, your new Intercontinental Champion. Um, one of two, or I think three. Yeah, one of three, actually, title changes on this show. So kicking off on a high note. So Drew McIntyre, your new Intercontinental Champion, kicking off his singles career on a very high note. Um, you know, winning that prestigious Intercontinental Championship and would go on to hold it for the next five months. So a good win for Drew McIntyre on this show. Up next, we would have the Women's Championship on the line. Michelle McCool defending against Mickey James. Um, not their best outing. They had better matches. Not, you know, not, of course, worse than their Royal Rumble match, which would last, of course, all of 20 seconds, maybe something along those lines. But, uh, I mean, it was a good match, but it was kind of used as the buffer. It was really nothing all that notable. You kind of knew in the back of your mind that while watching this contest that they couldn't do better. But um, aside from some interference from Layla at ringside, and I think she came up on the ring apron, aside from that, it was a clean victory for Michelle McCool, who retained the Women's Championship here. Um, they had a pretty lengthy feud over the SmackDown brand. People, you know, it was at around this point in time after Survivor Series where they started jumping to the fact where they were making fun of Mickey James for being Piggy James, that whole bullshit storyline. I thought that was ridiculous. A lot of people did too, especially since it was stemming off of real life issues, even though Mickey James was always hot in my opinion. But um, like I said before, it was a good match. You just knew in the back of your mind that Mickey James and Michelle McCool could deliver a much better match. And I mean, this is only my opinion, but I always thought Michelle McCool was always a very good in-ring worker. <clears throat> Would I call her overrated? Maybe did she deserve to win as many championships as she did because she was banging The Undertaker or she is banging The Undertaker. They're married. Um, I thought she deserved that. I think she. I didn't think she was one of the best of all time, but um, I did think. I, I don't think she deserves all the hate that she kind of gets most of the time, and that she was overrated. Um, maybe she's slightly overrated, but I do think she was a very in ring, very good in ring worker, and this kind of was kind of an example of that. But like I said before, um, these two could have a better match, and they did later down the line. 
Up next for the WWE Championship, a tables match for the WWE title with then WWE Champion John Cena defend, defending against the hot up and comer Sheamus, who had just jumped ship from the ECW brand to Monday Night Raw, was running rough shot over the entire Raw roster, taking out Jerry Lawler, Santina Morella, even Raw guest Sosa Mark Cuban six days prior to this event. So Sheamus was being built up very, very well. I really thought that because Sheamus, I mean, TLC at this point in time, it was really just getting started, so it was kind of hard to say. But um, I thought this match would just be kind of a filler feud for um, for John Cena before moving into something more substantial going to WrestleMania season. And he would win back the belt and get involved in the title picture again going to WrestleMania season. So this whole feud is kind of pointless. But um, I, I thought they were just going to build up Sheamus like they did everyone else before. Because prior to this, they ne- <clears throat> they never really done anything like this. And where they build up a top heel and they go on to win the WWE title. Like they did something similar with Mark Henry Back in 2011, I think it was, with the whole Hall of Pain thing and him going on to win the World WWE Championship at the 2011 Night of Champions show. So this is this is kind of something new for Sheamus. And you knew at this point in time, John Cena for years and years and years was being built up as this invincible, uh, unstoppable force. Invincible um, would be unable to, um, you know, put a stop to anything that came in his path. So he would always come out victorious, still with the WWE title intact. And this was really no different, in my opinion, beforehand. But um, after the match, I was very shocked to learn that Sheamus would emerge victorious as the new WWE champion by way of putting John Cena through a table on this show. Now, there's a lot of controversy how John Cena went through the table. Um, he was pushed by Sheamus. I mean, he was uh, John Cena took a lead back, but, you know, typical pro wrestling bullshit. But uh, even still, though, um, it was a rather clean victory for Sheamus. It wasn't like he cheated. I mean, the, the face commentators, Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler, were trying to make... Uh, trying to make it seem like it was controversial, like he Sheamus cheated, but he didn't cheat. It was a tables match. Whether he pushed him or not, he fell through the table. Sheamus won, new champion. I mean, I don't really understand where the controversy stems from here. Um, and Matt Stryker, who was a heel commentator at the time, was kind of making note of that. He was just saying that there's really no controversy here. We have a new WWE champion. He went through the table. There's really nothing to debate here, and he's right. Um, the match itself, I thought, was okay. It went about 16 minutes. Um, it was in the undercard. I mean, it could have easily closed the show to make it more of a memorable moment, but um, it was a big moment. It wasn't like a big pop when Sheamus won. Just a lot of shock and awe seeing that he you know, came off the ECW brand only three months prior to this. And for the first time since about Brock Lesnar, I, I'm going to say, that did someone really, from their debut, go on to uh, become such a big thing in the WWE winning the World Championship? I think he didn't win the world title as quickly as Brock Lesnar did. I think he was off by a couple days, I think at most. But, um, you know, he debuted in June, won the title in December. Um, Brock Lesnar won the title in August and debuted in April. So maybe by a month or two. But um, still pretty close. And I always thought Sheamus was the young, up-and-coming version of Brock Lesnar for the longest time. But uh, still, though, I thought this was a good matchup. They've had better matches. Sheamus and John Cena have never had great matches. I always thought they had good matches, and this was kind of an example of that. Tables matches can be, you know, either hit or miss. I thought this was okay. Um, I thought it was good. If, if I had to give it one or the other, I would give it a hit. But, um, you know, the, the finish overshadowed the entire matchup and a new champion being crowned in the form of Sheamus. So up next, we have the World WWE Championship up for grabs. The last time, I think, that a WWE and World WWE title match kind of wore back-to-back and then a non-title, or it was a title match to close off the show, but it was for the tag team titles. So um, I can't remember a time in history since then in the last five years that a tag team title match closed the show. But um, regardless, though, Undertaker and Batista had far better matches in 2007. It was probably due to the fact that their feud going into the show was really not all that great. Batista was really um, coming off as a hot heel over in the SmackDown brand. But at the end of the day, I mean, he was still feuding with Rey Mysterio. So it kind of felt like it should be Mysterio versus Batista, not Undertaker versus Batista. Undertaker was just kind of a... Um, overshadowed third player, the third wheel in this feud between those guys. And um, I always thought that a triple threat match would happen between them at the the Royal Rumble the following year and, uh, you know, the following month, but that didn't come to fruition. It was Mysterio versus Taker instead. But regardless, though, um, it was a good matchup. Like I said, with Sheamus and Cena, it was a good match. Not great, but, um, you know, for uh, by any other match standards, I would call it pretty good. By by an Undertaker-Batista match standard, it was uh, not as great as their 07 matches by a long shot. I thought their Hell in the Cell match and the last man standing match, all the other matches they had that year or you know, two years prior to this, I thought were far better. But still a good match from the two. And the finish came when Batista used a low blow to pick up the 1-2-3, win the World Heavyweight Championship, SmackDown GM Teddy Long comes out and says, hey, it's a chairs match, you can use chairs, but there's still disqualifications in place. 
ring the bell where we start in this matchup. So kind of a playback on the uh, on the breaking point finish from a couple of months ago, from a couple of months earlier between Punk and Taker, and go back and check that. I haven't reviewed that show yet. Maybe at some point, but um, still the match gets restarted. Taker hits a tombstone. One, two, three. Still your World Heavyweight Champion. Good match with a very shitty finish. I know they were trying to protect Batista, but the fact that there's no DQs in a chairs match like that's really retarded in my opinion. Um, I don't know why they just don't, uh, you know, allow disqualifications like they do in a tables match. Or it's not like oh, in a table in a ladder match you can only use ladders, but everything else there is disqualifications in place. Like that makes no fucking sense. Chairs matches have always been stupid in my opinion. This was really no exception. I've always hated chairs matches. And uh, this, that I, I would say that the stipulation definitely hindered um, their match in this case. Um, it probably could have been better without the stupid chair stipulation, but you know, I mean, it was one way of protecting Batista, so I guess there is that. So, still your world heavyweight champion, The Undertaker. Up next for the, uh, there were no championship up for grabs here, but it was Undertaker, or I'm sorry, Randy Orton versus Kofi Kingston, kind of stemming off the whole feud that those two had in the latter half of 2009, coming out of Survivor Series, Kofi Kingston's big win, and the Boom drop the uh, the uh, yeah the boom drop through the table and MSG like those huge moments and um, you know it was building to this one on one matchup at TLC it lost a little bit of steam since Survivor Series but still it was a good feud going into the show and um, it was a really good matchup got about 13 minutes it wasn't a great match but a pretty good matchup um, from Orton and Kingston they worked very very well together um, it was a very odd finish too because Orton would go for the punt kick and technically he would connect but he hit Kofi Kingston in the armpit. So to the people in the arena, it looked like he connected, it looked like he didn't, and Kofi sold it like he did, and the commentators were also confused, and then he would hit the RKO when it was over. Like a very weird finish. That was kind of the common theme throughout this show with a lot of odd finishes. Um, so Randy Orton emerged victorious here, which I did not have a problem with initially, and I would not pinpoint this matchup, this the finish of this contest, as a burial of Kofi Kingston. Because I think even after this, there were plans in place to have Kofi win the Money in the Bank match at the WrestleMania 26 pay-per-view a couple months later. It was actually after their rematch on the January 4th episode of Raw in 2010, a couple of weeks later, that um, that the stipul- that Kofi Kingston push would be halted. Actually, I don't even think it was in that match. I think it was a triple threat match with Orton, Kingston, and uh, Cena. A number one contenders match for the title, where they botched the finish, and Orton called him stupid, 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 and... You know, that whole thing, which is still infamous to this day. I think that was the point where he got buried for good. Um, and Kofi Kingston has been in the shitter, has been on the shit list since for WWE. But um, still, though, a pretty good showing here from Kofi Kingston. A very strong showing for him. And uh, on the other wise, I thought it was a very good matchup from Orton and Kingston. Did not necessarily agree with Randy Orton going, going over, but I thought it was okay. If only because I thought Kingston could pick up his victory and get his win back. At some point in time, which he never did, but um, actually he did about five years later, but still, though, um, good match of Orton Kingston right before the main event. Kind of placed it right before. I mean, it, it, it was really saying something about Kofi Kingston that they put him on after the two world title matches. So that was really saying something, so I enjoyed that. So up next, we had the TLC matchup, tables, ladders, and chairs matchup for the WWE Unified Tag Team titles with D-Generation X contending for the straps against Chera Show, Chris Jericho in the big show. It's not going to go down as one of the greatest TLC matches of all time, but for what it was, though, I thought it was a really good matchup. Um, you know, considering the fact that Big Show can't climb ladders, and this was before the 2010 Money in the Bank pay per view when he would create his own ladder to climb up. So he did not institute that here. But, um, you know, they had a lot of innovative spots with, like, Jericho and Big Show's shoulders, and they were having, like, a Star Wars duel on the, on the stage between HBK and Jericho, and those two have always worked amazingly together. So that was really no surprise. But Triple H and Big Show held their own. They made it a pretty good matchup. Tag team table or tag team ladder matches and stuff like this. Like you think back to the you know the, the triple threat TLC matches with the Hardys and the Dudleys and Edge and Christian. Like those were amazing. But they had the right players. Like you put in DX, who wasn't really known a, a team that's not really known for their ladder skills aside from Michaels. But Triple H isn't really uh, for the most part. And, I mean, Big Show has never really competed in many ladder matches. Jericho's a ladder match guy. Like, you go back and watch the ladder match from Jericho and HBK from the No Mercy pay-per-view in 08, and that was amazing. But compared to this, I mean, that was, like, godlike. Because um, this matchup, I mean, I th- like I said before, it was good. And it got uh, probably a bit more time than it should have. I would have given some more time for the other matches. This went about 22 minutes. 
But um, DX would emerge victorious, the new WWE Unified Tag Team Champions, their first ever reign as tag team champions. And it's surprising, because these guys were around for close to 10 years by this point. I mean, of course, on and off. But you would think that at one point in their 10-year stint that these guys are over 10 years, actually, that they would have won the tag team titles and they had never done so before this show. So that was kind of a historic moment for DX. So I was glad to see that happen. Um, but still, that was really... Uh, I mean, it was not the best main event, but it was enjoyable, I'll say that much. But um, like I said before, you really would have thought they would have given them the titles beforehand, so um, the fact they did here was uh, made for a very milestone moment for D-Generation X. And it's a good thing they did it here, considering the fact that Michaels, they probably knew that he was retiring at WrestleMania that year, hence why they gave him the big tag team title win with Triple H here, as opposed to him retiring and saying that, oh, D-Generation X, one of the greatest teams of all time to never win the titles. So at least they put that to rest in the show. So overall, I thought it was a good show. Um, you know, for, in comparison to the 2010 shows, 2011, and especially the 2012 installments, this kind of, you know, paled in comparison to that. I thought it was a good show. The other installments I thought were a lot better, a lot greater than this one. But, I mean, you're not wasting your time if you go back and watch this on the network. I thought there were a handful of very good matches. Um, if you're going to watch one match from this show... Probably Christian and Benjamin. I know that comes out as kind of surprising, but I thought they had a great match to, to kick off the show. Orton and Kingston was good. The two world title matches were okay, but the finish of the world title match sucked, so don't go back and watch the Taker and Batista match. I know that sounds kind of weird if you watch the 07 matches, but this match was really not all that good. Sheamus and John Cena, the finish was just kind of historic. So, you know, this was kind of a, a, a historic pay-per-view with the first ever installment of the TLC pay-per-view. So it was historic in that sense. DX winning the first ever tag team titles. Um, Sheamus winning his first ever WWE title. And Drew McIntyre winning his first ever singles title, the Intercontinental Championship as well. So in a nutshell, it was a historic show. Is it a great show? Not really, especially in comparison to the other pay-per-views, the other installments of this pay-per-view. But I, I give it a thumbs up. I wouldn't, you know, recommend you not watch it on the network, but there are better installments to keep your eye out for that I will be reviewing here on the channel in coming days, weeks, whatever, over the course of December. That being said, folks, make sure you check me out on Facebook at Graham Jason and Matthews, on Twitter at WrestleRant. And in the meantime and in between time, I'm Graham Jason and Matthews, and I'll catch you guys in my next video.